Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manish Kranny alongside Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. The U.S. House approves $95 billion in aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan, ending a six-month political impasse. Investors look for an AI-powered rebound on Wall Street with big tech results on deck. And Tesla spends the weekend cutting prices ahead of a crucial earnings report tomorrow. Good morning. You have a moment of reprieve in the S&P futures. $18 trillion worth of market cap will report this week. 40% of the S&P in terms of market cap. We've just broken six days of a drop, 4.5%. NVIDIA, love the line from Goldman Sachs. NVIDIA is the most important stock on Earth. The stock dropped by 10% on Friday. It has a small reprieve this morning, up 1.6%. Yields uh, are up by three basis points. Again, corporate bond issuance uh, will take center stage along with sovereigns. $183 billion worth of twos, fives, and sevens will come. Uh, we're up a little bit this morning. Bitcoin, 66,000 at the moment. The halving has happened. The event has happened. Daily production will drop, uh, Danny, to 450,000. JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank say it's all in the price. 66,000 and counting. We a monster week of Oof. reporting to get through. Danny, good morning. Good morning, a monster week of reporting. We also have PCE on Friday. All of it, man, is the strength of which might go to continue to support the dollar. This has been the thing that has been on the mind of nearly every emerging market banker and even the ECB Lagarde said last week that they were paying attention to FX moves. It's made even more stark the IMF upgrading U.S. growth by a staggering 0.9 percentage points. And it is that growth differential that ultimately will perhaps give uh, the dollar haven along with rates and to a certain extent, Roro. JP Morgan have a note out this morning, strong dollar is not a U.S. problem. Mm. Intervention is unlikely. And yet that is essentially what Janet Yellen, in theory, yep. wrote down uh, in terms of that release last week for South Korea along with Japan. But let's talk about what our next guest thinks. Uh, it is Jane Foley, and she writes this. The current dollar strength is built around the expectation that the Fed rates will stay high for longer, boosted by safe haven demand, stemming from fears of an escalation in the Middle East crisis. So, Jane Foley is standing by for us. Jane, good morning. Good to see you. Um, look, look, the dollar really has trounced everything else since the start of the year. It's up 4%. There is nobody who has survived the drive-by. Now, if we are in a higher for longer narrative, what does that do to the enduring strength of the dollar? Well, I mean, we, we've seen that. I mean, perhaps this morning we have seen a little bit of the de-escalation of the Middle East, so perhaps a little bit of reprieve uh, this morning. But the big picture is, as you point out, uh, all to do with dollar strength. Now, uh, I think we, we know the story uh, with re the yen. I think we're, we're familiar with the story of, of, of China, Korea, that statement that we had last week from Korea, Japan and the U.S., uh, really clarifying that the, uh, I think the officials of both uh, South Korea and Japan you know, want to have the U.S. perhaps a little bit on side if they were to intervene. But, of course, everybody says, well, intervention, intervention is only going to be really successful in turning a currency pair if the fundamentals turn. And so, therefore, if they intervene, it could be a costly mistake until those uh, fundamentals turn. And it could be another few months, maybe September, until the Fed cuts interest rates. So some of those central banks are, are really going to have to, um, you know, bide their time, you know, try and make the most of verbal intervention, yeah. perhaps for the next few months until those fundamentals start to alter. Well, verbal intervention only, only works so far, Jane, especially for emerging markets that are really struggling with a stronger dollar. We're by no means at, at crisis levels yet, but at what point does it become that? Well, again, I mean, uh, I think it's very difficult to actually name a level. I mean, we can look at 155 for, for Dolly, and yes, that's going to be sensitive. But it is going to be difficult to, to, to name a level. It's all related to the pace. It's all related to how the fundamentals are, are working through at that particular point in time. And I, we do have a Bank of Japan policy meeting this week. There is speculation out there that the Bank of Japan could be hiking interest rates again in, in October, maybe twice this year. And I think as long as we've got some of that speculation ticking over, it's going to be useful to, to perhaps prevent the yen from slipping too much further. And we need to keep an eye on those Japanese fundamentals too. I mean, clearly, I, I think the dollar and the dollar fundamentals are perhaps the, the stronger ones here, but the, the yen fundamentals are important too. We did have a survey out uh, just a few days ago uh, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, the, the consumers in Japan are a little bit more tolerant of uh, price hikes and perhaps elsewhere. That's good news for the Bank of Japan. But the, what they want to see is real incomes turning positive. That could happen, should happen in the next few months, and that would give a big boost 
Do Bank of Japan rate hike expectations? So, Jane, then the narrative with yen and perhaps the crosses against yen is that further yen depreciation will only be stopped or can only be stopped in its tracks by a couple of hikes. Is that enough to put a cap, as it were, on the dollar or a floor? I mean, if we invert it, if, is that what's going to put a floor on the yen, on the crosses, to uh, one, possibly two more hikes, rather than uh, some kind of unilateral intervention? Because unilateral intervention in of itself is rarely successful. Absolutely. Again, it's only really successful when you know that the, that the fundamentals have turned. And, and to be honest, it's often only obvious that the fundamentals have turned in hindsight. Yeah. So, from, and, I, and I think this is really part of why the Ministry of uh, Finance hasn't uh, intervened just yet, because of the fundamental picture. So, uh, you know, the, the Bank of Japan policy meetings are key, but I think they do have to wait until maybe August or so when, when the market really is getting quite excited about the possibility of a September interest rate uh, move from the Federal Reserve. At that point in time, I think life is going to be a lot easier uh, for the likes of, of the, the, the Japanese authorities, the Korean authorities, mm. the Indian authorities, various others in, in, in Asia too. But if, if we don't get that, Jane, at the same time, the yen is trading at its weakest in 30 years versus the renminbi, versus China's currency. Surely that's an elastic that can only stretch so far. Well, you know, uh, there are some upsides to, to the weaker currency. For instance, look at the tourism figures into Japan now. that They're really, really strong. And that, of course, is, is a, a, an export industry because of the, the weaker yen. Now, we did have commentary from one of the Japanese officials the other day so saying that, uh, uh, that, that there's too much uh, in, in terms of the, the bias of... of of the, the good and the bad from, from yen weakness. It's sort of switched. There's too much bad coming through from that yen weakness. So they do want to stop it. They've been relatively successful with their verbal intervention, but it is a really testing time for them. But we've got to remember, in, in the list of you know, the weakest performing uh, currencies this year, it's not just the Asian currencies. We've had a number of G10 currencies in that list too, like the, the, the Aussie and the New Zealand dollar, the, the, the Swiss franc, the Swedish krona. Uh, they're all in that list too. So uh, those, however, perhaps not at quite as sensitive levels um, uh, relative to the dollar. But even so, you know, that there is um, this broad-based theme of, of the dollar really pushing hard uh, against uh, perhaps the, the will of some of the monetary authorities. Jane, we talk about divergence, and it was a big theme um, last week, the rates divergence uh, between Powell and Williams. Williams sort of trying to convince the market, look, we're not even... Uh, he was answering a specific question in that, you know, our base case is not to raise rates. But the market has latched a hold of this differential higher for longer in the U.S. relative to Europe. But I'm drawn to your notation of the fiscal situation in France, uh, along with perhaps the overly optimistic view on the fiscal and deficit situations for Italy and France as two additional flesh wounds to the divergence story. So, therefore, is it only a period of time before parity is hit with three different arrows piercing the euro at the same time. You know, I do think the risks of, of parity have certainly increased. I mean, our long-term forecast for a while now has been 105, and, you know, we're, we're with that. But we've always had sympathy for the parity view. But, you know, one interesting part of this is that for, for Europe, it's quite possible that a weaker euro will actually be welcome. Now, the, the reason I say that is because we've got the ECB obviously switching its focus away from inflation towards growth. I mean, that, that's because, you know, it is signalling that it will be cutting interest rates in, in June. So we've got this pivot going on. Now, that assumes that the, the, the vast majority of the inflationary battle potentially you know, has been won. Now, of course, as ifs and there's buts, you know, what happens if oil prices were to rise further? What happens if there's an escalation in the Middle East, for instance? But if we assume that the, the battle to contain in inflation is mainly won, if we assume that the labour market will be loosening, that there's been an awful lot of hoarding in, in labour in Europe, that's got to come to an end. Uh, and therefore, if the focus is going to be on growth, particularly if you're in a country like Germany, I would imagine that a, a period of a weak euro could actually be welcomed, given the hit to the manufacturing in, in, in Germany in particular mm. uh, and, and the impact of the, the last few years of the energy crisis. So I, I think we got to a position there, whereas as long as we had relative stability, that I think euro dollar could remain fairly weak Jane, for quite a even, period. Even if there is a spike in oil prices, Villaroy was speaking over the weekend saying that they would still cut, that a June cut is still okay unless it was something extremely out of the ordinary. Do you buy that, that higher oil would still allow them to cut in the summer? 
Uh, well, I, I suppose it depends, you know, how much and how fast. But, but I think, yes, I think um, if oil were to rise further, I think what we're probably questioning is how much further will the ECB go beyond June and how fast will that pace of interest rate cutting be after June. I think that's where the uncertainty is with respect to the ECB. But actually, if we were to, say, move to, to, to 105 into the summer, maybe, you know, drip down towards uh, parity, I don't think that uh, means that we cannot have any further interest rate cuts because of the weakness of particularly the manufacturing sectors, the weakness of growth. And when we look at the budget positions in, in Europe, the new rules for the, the Eurozone, there's going to be several countries, including France, including Italy, you know, that have budgetary constraints on them, and that means slower growth. And when we have an environment of slower growth, well, you know, a weakened euro could actually be quite useful. So I don't mm. think a softened euro is a big problem for, for, right. for the uh, ECB at these sorts of levels. Yeah, Jane, we've, we've heard plenty of doomsdays about what happens if the Fed doesn't cut and the ECB does, so it's refreshing to hear that point of view. Jane Foley, thank you so much for joining us. Jane Foley of Rabobank. Now, Manis, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Donald Trump faces a cash crunch as his trial costs mount. According to campaign finance filings, Trump spent $4.9 million on legal fees in March and has just $6.8 million left in the accounts he's been using to fund his lawyers. Trump could seek to raise more money from donors or ask the Republican National Committee to cover the costs. Trump returns to court later today. Volkswagen employees at a Tennessee factory have voted to join the United Auto Workers. It's a landmark victory for the union organizing in the long, hostile U.S. South. If this result formally certified by the agency, Volkswagen will be legally required to collectively bargain over working conditions and compensation at the plant. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimundo says Huawei's latest phone shows that China remains behind on cutting-edge chip technology. Huawei unveiled a smartphone powered by a homegrown chip last August. In an interview with CBS, Raimundo downplayed the company's claim of a breakthrough, bound to take the strongest possible action to protect U.S. national security. And U.S. bill forcing TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance to sell up could become law within days. The legislation was included in a crucial aid package for Ukraine and Israel passed by the House over the weekend. Sources tell Bloomberg that ByteDance intends to fight the effort in court if it's enacted. The company is also said to be planning to remove a key executive responsible for convincing the US that it's doing enough to stave off national security concerns about its connections to China. And speaking of which, coming up, the U.S. House gets a $95 billion aid package across the finish line. We're going to have more on that ahead. And as it grapples with falling sales and intense EV war, Tesla cuts prices in a number of global markets, including China and Germany. More on this story right here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger alongside Manish Cranny in New York. Now, after slumping sales and an oversupply of inventory, Tesla cut its model prices over the weekend in both China and Europe, as well as some driver assistance software in the U.S. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. So, Craig, uh, among the many things that's happening at Tesla, we now have another moment where they're cutting prices again, potentially fueling another price war, especially in China. Is there a clear reason behind this? And can they really juice more growth out of higher volumes? I, I think it, it is really hard to follow here because if, if we go back just a few weeks, uh, you know, Tesla for, for a while was, you know, sort of uh, advertising like a temporary $1,000 price cut and sort of, you know, come and get your Tesla now because prices are going up. Now prices uh, of the Model Y, uh, for example, have actually dropped, you know, back not only back uh, to to where they, you know, increased prices at the end of the quarter, but below uh, that level, back to as low as they've been. There, there's uh, real, you know, challenges with sort of coming to grasp with what the heck is going on here, and you know, I do think that there are, you know, very valid questions of just how much more volume you can get out of the Model Three and the Model Y, even with, you know, more more uh, discounts in the sense that, you know, if if I'm a consumer. Why, why would I uh, want to go out and buy a Tesla now and, and sort of catch a falling knife? There's a real question about where the floor is for these vehicles. 
Craig, good morning. You know, the distance between genius and strategy is often debated. Is this company, <laughs> you know, where, where are we with Elon Musk? I mean, we're hanging our hat on robo-taxis on August the 8th. We are cancelling meetings in India, which is the future. Genius or chaos at the moment? I, I think you have to lean toward chaos uh, just in the sense that, you know, there are people who will defend this, you know, pivot that Musk is making to robo taxis that, you know, the reason you invest in Tesla is for, you know, moonshots that, you know, everyone says is, is impossible, but only Elon Musk can pull it off. And, you know, you've, you've made some some good money if you've made those bets in the past. I think robo taxis, though, is, is a really difficult proposition for, for investors to wrap their minds around in part because Tesla has been pursuing these for, you know, at least eight years, and it's really difficult technology. There are questions about, you know, whether it's going to be ready not only years from now, but, but a decade from now. And, you know, you only have to look as far as, you know, Google and, and the amount of investment and commitment that they put into this technology and this business pro proposition and, and see this idea that, you know, this is fits and starts, it's challenges working with you know, state and local regulators. And this is, is not, you know, a, a, a situation where, you know, Musk will be able to sort of put fully self-driving cars and just, you know, kind of throw his hands up and say, you know, I'm done. This is, is something that's going to take significant investment, Craig, a lot of execution risk. Craig, Danny and I were just talking about this this morning. You, you know, we, we sort of hold things up in the sky and we go, well, there you go, robo-taxis. But to scale robo taxis, you need a hell of a lot of global mm. regulation to let those things go up in the sky, don't you? I mean, you can do it in Dubai, maybe, because it's new and it's got the space, but <laughs> downtown London, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine that in New York either, something like that rolling off. I mean, they've tested it throughout the U.S., have they not, Craig? Different, different companies trying to roll that and have had regulatory pushback yeah. when, when things go awry. Yeah, and I, I go back to this idea that, you know, the U.S. Uh, absolutely... Uh, has has sent these signals like, look, we, we don't want to get in the way of this technology that has the potential to make roads safer. Uh, and yet, you know, I go back to, you know, the example of Uber years ago when the, the then governor said, you know, we have open arms and open roads for Uber's uh, self-driving vehicles. All it took was one fatality. Mm. Uh, and yeah. I don't mean to sort of diminish that that death, but it takes one fatality and boom, the governor says, all right, that's it, you're done. Uh, that is the sort of challenge that, that it lies ahead if this is the pivot this company wants to make. Okay, Craig, I, I think that's a, a very good consolidation in, in terms of the risks, uh, the real risks. Mm. Uh, Craig Trudell, and of course you can catch the big take, uh, everything that you need to know on that. Snapshot of bonds. It is counting down to Friday. It's going to be a heck of a week because we're counting down to PC on Friday. Um, and the road to hell, as I say, is often paved with good intentions, Danny, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what level of hellish were, bond market you're going to have to do now. Then, well. I thought you were going to say the road to hell is, uh, is uh, paved with treasury auctions. Well, there is the, you can have that. There's a bit of supply. Would you like some twos, fives, sevens? Yeah. I'd say I'm probably more in the market for sevens or fives. Belly of the curve. You'll hear all the notes will come in and tell you that real money wants to buy five-year paper belly of the curve that's where you want to be yeah we have so we all those options I'm front running the notes. also don't forget manis we have bank of japan on friday too yeah, yeah. strap in and tech earnings we're going to discuss all that coming up hell of a lot of tech earnings okay there's your bond board for you we're taking slightly higher monday morning setting the agenda for you on bloomberg brief Monday edition of Bloomberg Brief with me, Manus Cranny, and Danny Berger alongside. We decided to bring you the front pages and look at what's making the headlines around the world. First up, you've got the $60 billion aid for the U.S. throwing a lifeline to the Ukrainian military, Danny. Uh, now, this quickly reaches the front lines. That's the question. Bloomberg reports that the aid will be helpful. Uh, more is needed, and that's according to research. Well, of course, a huge political implications there uh, on Capitol yes. Hill for the Speaker. Yes, and certainly some comfort for U.S. allies. Next up, Manus, the New York Stock Exchange 
is testing the waters for trading stocks around the clock. So 24-7, there's a growing interest in overnight trading. This comes from the FT, and they're reporting that the Exchange Data's analytics team has put out a market survey. This reminds me, did you ever see that ad for interactive brokers where two people are on a date and the woman is like, hang on, uh, while we're having wine, let me just do some hedging trades. That's, that's what the world is going to become. That's actually what she did on her current husband. She said, excuse me, I've got a few, I've got some a few trades. trades. It, look, it's about capturing market share. That's yes. fundamentally what it's about. And again, going further and deeper against LSE and the other uh, bourses around the world. Now to UBS, we've been tracking this story obviously constantly. It's about the job cuts. There will be five rounds of job cuts. They they will start in June. This is according to the uh, Swiss newspaper Sontag uh, Zuntang. As the cost-cutting measures at the lender uh, post the Credit Suisse integration, UBS has declined to comment. It was a Reuters report, but of course, Danny, this goes back to the scale of what they've got mm -hmm. to do. Globally, we understand 30 to 50,000 jobs overall but this is about the swiss component of the business yes the politically most sensitive probably yes and i, I pulled out a quote from uh the sontag report saying that quote in total this is according to yeah. someone they didn't name 50 to 60 percent of x credit suite staff will probably be laid off in the next 50 rounds 50 to 60 percent manis well this goes back to colin kelleher the chairman of ubs who at the time ft article where he said he talked about the culture filter which was about cultural contamination. A lot of the bad actors had already left. This is now about the reality of integration of CS into UBS. Yep, next round's August, September, October, November. What a run up to the holiday season. Tough, very, very tough. From our global headquarters in New York, I'm Danny Berger alongside Manus Cranny. Let's set your agenda. The U.S. House approves $95 billion of aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan, ending a six-month political impasse. Investors look for an AI-powered rebound on Wall Street as a slew of big tech results arrive this week. And Tesla spends the weekend cutting prices ahead of the crucial earnings report tomorrow. So we get Tesla tomorrow, man. So we're going to have four out of the MAG7 reporting this week. U.S. futures are higher this morning, but it was a tough week last week for tech. They're worse in about 18 months. How do earnings shake things up? Ten-year yields, they are higher this morning, about three basis points. For the macro event, we're going to have to wait until Friday until we get PCE and a whole lot of treasuries, mostly the front end and the belly of the curve. Finally, oil, despite... Another round of news continuing to come from the Middle East. Besides Friday, having that retaliatory reported attack from Israel to Iran, Brent crude is significantly lower. We're down by about eight-tenths of a percent. It's down 3.5 percent on the week. That is its worst week since early February. It is an uneasy calm, to be sure, at the moment, with new sanctions coming on to Iranian oil from the U.S. And it's interesting, Manis, you listened to Francois Villaroy over the weekend saying that even if Brent crude will, were to move higher, that does not dissuade the ECB from going at a hike in June. It's the differential and nothing seems to be able to stop it. And then as Jen Foley said, it's about the speed of travel. How quickly do you break from 90 to $100 if that's the direction of travel? By the way, positioning on the oil market, net longs, Brent net longs are at a three-year high. So the market is still gearing up uh, for a long position, but mm. it's going to be a monster week. I mean, what is it? 40% of the market reports this week, $18 trillion worth of market cap. And I'm fascinated by NVIDIA. It tanked by 10% on Friday. Yes. Small reprieve this morning. But, you know, where are the where are the notes in my inbox telling me that it's a correction? <laughs> yes. That I should be buying the dip? Wait, this is, this is the incredible thing, is we made... We were so excited about the way up for NVIDIA, and I feel like yeah. the way down has, has just been a blip. There hasn't been either a big deal made out of it or everyone clamoring to buy the thing. Yeah, but then this is all about tail risk, which plays perfectly to what our next guest is talking about. Yes, and, and to that point, Manis, mm -hmm. our next guest writes that the most notable change in options market is that the left tail is waking up. Joining us now is Amy Wu Silverman, head of Deri derivative strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Amy, I remember last time you joined us a month or so ago, you said the right tail is the new left tail. All anyone wanted were upside hedges. So what's changed? 
has been the biggest change. Good morning. You know, for as long as I can remember this year, it's been all about the right tail, about that FOMO and MOMO. And I really think the biggest inflection point difference is that left tail is waking up. And, you know, I just want to say one thing. Look, it's not that NVIDIA hasn't sold off before. We've seen that happen. It's the first time, though, in options where yes. that left tail has picked up because of it. You crushing my dreams there. I was hoping. I was. I'm hoping for a, bi a sort of a, a big response on Nvidia and a clamor, <laughs> and a clamor of people coming in. Um, how do I? I mean, look, we've had these moments. We've had four and a half percent drawdown, six sessions in a row. Um, to, to what extent has that repriced the left tail risk? Or would you say, Amy, look, man, you can still buy put spreads. You can still do something active, which has value to protect yourself. You know, this market is not exactly crumbling, Amy. It's merely taking a breather. You know, that's exactly right. And sometimes I think the best thing to do is, you know, take that year to date chart of that left tail waking up and pull it back five years, pull it back 10 years, look on a historical basis, that left tail, that idea of owning puts or put spreads on your S&P or VIX calls, what have you, it's still incredibly inexpensive. We're talking about 25th to 30th percentile on a longer dated average. It's just simply year to date. It looks so expensive because that just hasn't been something that folks have focused on. So, you know, look, 99th percentile year to date, sure. But on a broader history, can you buy portfolio insurance? Absolutely. And we, mm. and that's what we're saying you should do if this is a concern. And as you mentioned, Amy, people did it with NVIDIA. And that seems to be what's changed. Again, as you pointed out, just from the other sell-offs we've seen, put volume on Friday for NVIDIA was its highest since 2007. Is this a sentiment shift? Does this say something wider about the enduring nature of the sell-off we saw last week in NVIDIA and, again, more broadly, chip stocks because also puts on TSMC, similar story? Yeah, I'd say there are two critical things to think about here, Danny. The first is, you know, one thing we talked about last month was this idea that momentum begets momentum. So when that momentum train is going, you really, really don't want to get in front of it, even if that right tail looks really expensive, because there's so many exacerbating factors that perpetuate momentum. I would say that's severely flagged. And the second thing I would say is, in terms of NVIDIA, it's just about weightiness. You know, so it's this idea of maybe positioning wise, people have gotten long, people have dipped their toe in the water, they've jumped in the pool. So, of course, there's simply more to hedge. But there's also this idea that if tech goes, the market goes. It's not only been a proxy for AI, it's just been the heaviest market weight for components like QQQs or XLC. Man, here's the fun fact I got for you, what Amy is just talking about. OK, NVIDIA falls 10 percent Friday. It contributed to 0.9 percent of the overall loss in the S&P 500 on Friday. Yeah, but that plays to what, Amy, you've just said, which is where tech goes so, you know, so the whole end index goes because of the concentration risk. I'm just looking at UBS flashing across the screen here, cuts its view on the big six tech stocks to neutral from overweight. I mean, there, there is justification in breadth. There is justification in going for breadth, and that's been one of the narratives that we've seen through this quarter. When you look across the other Magnificent Seven, you talk about uh, Meta, and of course, two of the big AI plays were Meta uh, along with uh, Microsoft, and you talk about Meta uh, being relatively inexpensive to hedge. Yeah, so I wanted to bring those up because obviously these are companies that are reporting this week, big mag seven names. And here's what's interesting on an implied move basis. So essentially we say, look, what's the implicit move on earnings day, since we know earnings day is this week of the option. And then we just compare it against historical moves on names like Microsoft and Meta. They actually look OK. I'm not saying they're screamingly cheap, mm -hmm. but the reason we're say they're pretty fair, man, is, is because when you look at Meta over the past six to eight quarters, this is a stock that moves plus or minus 20 percent. That's not what's being implied right now, but it certainly has the ability to do that. And not only that, because there's such flagship names for the rest of the market, there's also other exacerbating qualities of them. So, look, we still think these are options that are fair to own. To the upside or downside, it obviously depends on your original positioning, but we don't think they look that expensive in the context of, of those historical moves. What about small caps? I mean, these things, again... Much to my it's, chagrin. It's, it's, her, it's, it's, her, it's her literal obsession. It's my what? own personal Waterloo, some <laughs> might say, Amy. Um, they continue to get beat up, but you say put spreads can also make sense as well. Why, when already small caps 
have suffered so much, Amy. I know. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you, too. <laughs> Look, in terms of small caps, I think, I think it's just this question that our chief equity strategist always points out, which is, you know, they tend to work when you start to actually get into the rate cutting. And the issue is, that's not where we are right now. You know, like when you when you simply look at a graph of where we were in terms of rate cut expectations a few months ago mm -hmm. to now, you know, that's not where we are. And I think that's why to some degree, small caps are in a little bit of this no man's land, a little bit of in the dead zone. But obviously, their sensitivity to Fed speak is very high. So when you see those puts elevated, they are still attractive as sort of a hedge to that Fed speak. And so the idea that, look, if we potentially get Powell saying, even higher for even longer, they still work. And even though we've had that move down, I think that's why it's something that you can still use hedges on to kind of proxy that sensitivity to rates. Let's throw you a full left tail risk. Are you really, do you think the market really has begun to waken up to the possibility of a rate hike? And if there was, how would you best position for, albeit a very, very far left tail risk? Yeah, look, I, I don't think the market is there yet, but if, if that is something you're thinking about in terms of the left tail, you know, the, the, this, this idea that Larry Summers has talked about, as, as well as a few other people, just the idea that we actually could be facing hikes, this, this whole pricing of the curve could change. Again, that IWM sensitivity tends to be a good place to go because, again, when rate cuts happen, that's where it tends to outperform, but the vice versa happens as well. And again, just on an overall basis, 10,000 foot view basis, the left tail isn't that expensive. It's simply in a year-to-date context that I think we look at it as pricing so highly. Amy, I'm on the phone to the broker as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> as I say to Danny, I've only got one more major market meltdown yeah. left in me. And maybe we'll get to do those overnight trades soon, Manus. So you can be doing this at like, you know, midnight oh. on a Saturday. So that's exciting. Can't wait. Amy, thank you very much. <laughs> Repricing the left tail thank risk. Uh, Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets coming up. The U.S. house gets a $95 billion aid package for Ukraine and Israel across the finish line. It was a weekend of drama and consternation on Capitol Hill. This aid will strengthen Ukraine and send the Kremlin a powerful signal that it will not be the second Afghanistan. That was Ukraine's president speaking on NBC's Meet the Press on Sunday. This is the U.S. House approved in $95 billion in aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan in a package that included sanctions on Iran's oil sector. Let's get the details with Bloomberg's government, Zach Cohen, in Washington. Zach, thank you so much for being with us. The big headline, I mean, it was everybody included here, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. Just break down the $95 billion for us. How much of it flows back into the U.S. system and how much of it is real aid? This is really the culmination of Congress's efforts to uh, address the concerns of allies abroad. It does include about $60 billion uh, geared toward Ukraine. That's the broad majority of the package, two thirds of it, as well as uh, aid for Israel, uh, as it's in its uh, sixth war uh, in Gaza and in the face of these attacks from Iran, aid for Indo-Pacific allies, especially Taiwan, in the face of Chinese aggression. It also includes legislation that would force the divestiture of TikTok uh, by its Chinese owner, ByteDance. And so certainly a, a smorgasbord here uh, for the U.S., there's a spe specifically $14 billion that would go toward backfilling some of the weapons that had already been sent to Ukraine. And so this is going to go directly to uh, the effort of defense contractors to build up weapon systems for the U.S.'s stockpile. And so certainly enough for everybody here that creates it much more politically palatable uh, for Congress that's been really divided on this issue for months now. Yes. And, and, and Zach, to that point, I mean, it's huge for U.S. allies. We've continued to th have the conversation, especially with European leaders. Are you ready for Trump 2.0? But this conversation will now happen in the context that there is U.S. support there. Besides, for example, Mike Johnson having to contend with the most far right of his party. So is Johnson safe now? What does it mean for him to put their concerns aside and move this forward? The reason this bill was delayed as long as it was was precisely this concern. 
that Johnson, who's uh, fairly new into this job, was only elected as Speaker of the House back in October, would face a motion to vacate the chair or to oust the Speaker, essentially, uh, if he brought an aid package to Ukraine that didn't include some sort of policy provision that would bolster security along the southern border with Mexico. Remember, there was funding for the border with Mexico in the original package that the Senate passed uh, and that the White House requested, but there was this bipartisan deal that fell through and Republicans thought it wasn't tough enough. And Johnson basically said, look, we've got to move this aid to Ukraine. That's the most important part, especially in the face of these attacks by Iran on Israel. That created additional pressure to move the Israel portion of this package. And so Johnson ended up working with Democrats to pass this package uh, in a rather historic move, actually. Procedurally speaking, you don't see this often where Democrats or Republicans work in almost a coalition style government to get a package of this size through. Yeah, and there I mean, was a vote that showed that the majority of House Republicans actually still oppose Ukraine aid. But at the end of the day, why bipartisan majorities and majorities of both Democrats and Republicans supported sending it to the Senate? And I think that's perhaps the most <clears throat> the most interesting sort of fact here is that more Republicans voted against further aid to Ukraine, because in many ways, the ultra conservative voice of uh, Marjorie Taylor, Marjorie at Taylor, I think, sums it up on the extreme side, which is nothing has been done to secure our border or reduce our debt. And um, this is what she said on Saturday. Ukraine is not even a member of NATO. Now, that is on, on the extreme right side of, of the party. But to what extent, then, do you think the reality is that Speaker Johnson <clears throat> now could lose the speakership or certainly will be challenged um, for having almost gone against uh, the right of the party? Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has filed a motion to vacate the same procedural mechanism that ousted Kevin McCarthy from the speakership last year. Uh, of course, we have not seen the votes materialize yet in order to do that. There are two other Republicans who have since said, since this package was brought to the floor, that they would vote to oust uh, Johnson from the speakership. Um, but Republicans are very wary about that move, given the fact how long it was to apply a replacement for McCarthy in the first place. And Democrats have offered some assurances that they would provide some procedural help to keep Johnson in the job uh, in some way, maybe not voting for him as speaker directly, uh, but maybe tabling this motion to vacate. And so that bipartisan support for this move procedurally across the spectrum is what gives Johnson the cover in order to move this package. Now, whether Johnson remains speaker next year after Congress has new elections and yeah. reconvenes in January is a different mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, but at this point, the, there was enough bipartisan buy-in for this package and for at least given the Johnson the political cover in order to do so, mm -hmm. that the calls by these three members, which in a narrowly divided House normally might be enough to oust uh, somebody from the job, probably won't cut it this time around. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll be having that conversation sooner than we all think. Zach, thank you so much. Zach Cohen of Bloomberg Government. Now, within this bill, there was everything. There was also TikTok. The U.S. House is out with that bill, again, part of it requiring TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, to divest its stake in the social media app. The legislation, again, it was put out Saturday, is tied to the aid package, and the Senate is expected to vote on it in the coming days. Let's get the tech perspective now for more. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, this is something that TikTok had spent a lot of time and a lot of money lobbying against, and yet here we have this unprecedented move for the U.S. government to dictate the terms of a giant tech company. So what now? Well, if it passes, of course, the, as you say, there's a vote in the next few days. The president has said he will sign it into law if it passes through the Senate pretty quickly afterwards. It gives ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, a year to divest it. We don't know what that would look like, whether it would be a sale, maybe an IPO. Um, and if it doesn't succeed in doing that, then TikTok was, will be banned from the U.S. Now, ByteDance has said, TikTok has said, that it will challenge this in the courts. There are some legal experts who think that it may have a chance of succeeding in, in blocking this, this um, bill or law because of free speech rules. We'll have to see what happens. It's clearly going to be uh, a contentious and long fight. The key question actually is whether the, uh, the, the, the relevant judge in this instance will put a hold on this law coming into effect or say it proceeds, the timer starts, you know, when the law is passed um, as these legal cases play out. I mean, what's the reality of this, Alex? You know, divesting, you know, ByteDance divesting TikTok. Um, what value does it have here in the United States of America? There's that story that Steve Mnuchin uh, putting together, a band, a band of bidders. But what is it that would be split away from ByteDance if this goes through? Well, there's some debate about whether they would actually have the core IP, the core intellectual property, which is 
the algorithm that drives the whole thing, whether they might have to license that from ByteDance, whether they would have to somehow recreate it themselves. Don't forget that Donald Trump tried to do this uh, four or five years ago. At that time, there was a lot of interest from um, American companies. We heard the na names like Oracle. We heard Microsoft would be interested in, in buying it. There are a lot of big tech companies out there that don't have a social media division and might quite like one. Don't forget that Google sort of has one with YouTube. Obviously, Meta, that's its entire business. There are other players who might want to have a look. The price is perhaps a little bit lower than it was before. The, the multiples in the ad tech space have come down a little bit. And uh, without knowing for sure what exactly they'd be able to buy, it, and clearly this is a fire sale if it were to go through, mm. um, it, it does look like it could be a deal for someone. In the meantime, Alex, there was reporting that the U.S.-based general counsel for TikTok is going to be stepping down. Again, that's something that TikTok has disputed, but reports still nonetheless suggest that. Even if this doesn't go through, Alex, there's already clearly going to be some shakeup within the ranks. Are we looking at a fundamentally different TikTok, not just in their makeup, but their approach to the U.S. and the U.S. government? It's hard to tell, right? At the moment, this is the, the legal counsel. It's not you know, the top executive at the company. Uh, this is a company that technically is not a Chinese company. It is domiciled in, uh, in Singapore. The parent company, of course, in ByteDance, is uh, Chinese domiciled. Now, they have made some significant changes. They have put, said that data does not leave the U.S. They have invested, they say, something like $2 billion in improved moderation. The, the thing is that there have been some studies that suggest that maybe uh, if you search for terms like Tiananmen on TikTok, you will get fewer results than if you were to do it on Instagram. TikTok, of course, will debate. Um, it will dispute that, say that is not the case. But there are concerns about the nature of these content that is being served up to, to um, U.S. consumers. The final thing, of course, to remember here, TikTok itself is not allowed in China. China does not let TikTok operate there. It has a separate company called Douyin, which is owned by ByteDance. That serves up a whole different type of content to um, under-18s in China. So, uh, you know, the U.S., the China isn't necessarily practicing what it preaches when it also criticizes the U.S. for, for this uh, movement, for this move. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Webb uh, tracking the uh, amendments to the bill over the weekend on Capitol Hill. Coming up, a uh, big week for the Magnificent Seven, to say the very least. It's a beautiful day in New York. Uh, we'll talk you through uh, what to expect on $18 trillion worth of market cap reporting. In the United States of America, spoos are bouncing back up a half of 1%. Context matters on Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger with Manus Cranny in New York. Let's take a look at what's ahead this week. Get you set up for the trading week. It's an earnings bonanza. We're going to get Tesla first reporting on Tuesday. And then Boeing, Meta and IBM, they all report on Wednesday. And if that's not enough for you, Manus, we're going to round out the week with Microsoft, Alphabet, Intel, all on Thursday. More than 100 companies in the S&P 500 will be reporting this week. Yep, it's certainly going to be pivotal in terms of sentiment. Some of the micro movers to keep an eye on uh, as we go into as we go into uh, trading today. Tesla and Stellantis are falling as the EV market continues to struggle. Demand weakens. Salesforce takeover talks with the data management Informatica. Uh, cooled with both parties struggling to agree terms, according to a person familiar with the matter. Look at the stock done. Uh, sorry, Salesforce <laughs> up 3.4%. Those autos are going to be, it's going to be a really brutal and pivotal week for Elon Musk, isn't it? Cutting yes. prices over the weekend. I mean, it's a country, it's a company, one could say, facing some kind of chaos. Yes. Well, if you look at what might be his plan, he's cut 10% of the global workforce, says they're going to focus more on robo-taxis, but that is a far away story. That is not the here and the now. In the earnings, they will care about the growth here and now. Indeed. Uh, all eyes down for tech. $18 trillion worth of market capital hit the tape. We'll take you through blow by blow on Bloomberg.